Uh, God is good. God is good. He's faithful. Yes. I'm sure if I took a few moments of your time this morning and asked each one of you, how has God been faithful to you this past year? I'm sure each of you could give me some great example of how faithful God has been to you. I know for us, God has been faithful in many ways. I begin to look at our church family and I think and I look at each one of you and, and you know, we went through a, a, a rough year, a year of uncertainty, a year of confusion and do we do this or do we do that? Are we supposed to do this or that? You know, so much uncertainty. But as I look around this morning and I look at each one of you, I can see how faithful God has been. Amen. Yes. Some of you had, or I don't know about some of you, I know one of you for sure had contracted COVID and God brought you through. But the rest of you, he brought you through. Mm-hmm. Unscathed, unharmed, not touched. I was sharing with a friend this past week, and I said, you know, I can't help but think of all the churches that shut down for a month, some, some over a year, because of the uncertainty and being scared. And he said, well, how did you make it through? I said, I don't know. We didn't shut down. And he said, but why not? I said, because God is faithful. God is faithful. I said, where in the world could we go that we would be most assured of God's protection of anywhere else in the world but in his house where he rules and reigns? Because the word says where two or three are gathered together, he is there in the midst. Does it say there's a disease in the midst? Does it say there's a curse in the midst? It says he is in the midst. And where God is, most certainly, the righteousness of heaven is there also. And God is faithful. I began to think about what is it What is it we need at Christmas? Well, all of us in this room know for sure that we are in need of a Savior. God knew that at Christmas, that we were in need of a Savior. So he sent his only begotten to a lowly manger because he knew we needed a Savior. He knew that when he sent this most precious Holy gift, this baby who was going to bring salvation to the world. He knew that the world was going to mistreat him. Think about this for a moment, parents. Give this some thought. Your son, your child growing up. All of a sudden... People start being mean to him. They start cursing him. They start spitting on him. They start beating him. Doesn't that make your blood just start to boil? Mm -hmm. It does mine. That'll tell you I'm not perfect. But God knew this was going to happen to his son before he ever sent them. But yet today, in the society that we live in, we don't want to tell our children, well, we don't want to indoctrinate our children. You know, we don't want to force them to go to church because, you know, we want them to let them make up their own minds. Hogwash! Sorry. (laughs) But this is how the world is treating Jesus. It's sad so sad 
The church population is dropping off. The mega churches seem to be growing. Why is that? Well, because we just give them something to tickle their ears. Yep. Give them a little message of just happy, 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 joy, 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 and send them on their way. Let's, let's not prepare them for the hardships that the Word of God tells them that will come once they receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. But we don't want it. That'll do, Pastor, we can't do that. That'll discourage them. We don't want to discourage the world. We just want the, well, them to know that Jesus is love. He certainly is. <laughs> he loves each one of us. He loved us even when we were sinners. He loved us. And he still loves us. But yet, what do we need at Christmas? What do we need? We need a Savior. And God sent a Savior. He sent His Son. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus to, to the whole world that it should be taxed. And all went to be taxed in their own cities. Now I told some of the group this morning we're going to start in Isaiah chapter 6. It got changed. Okay. <laughs> we're actually in Luke chapter 2. <laughs> we might make it to Isaiah chapter 6. I don't know. Follow with me. And it came to pass. In those days, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus so that the whole world should be taxed. Uh, I, I hate to break it to you. April 15th is coming pretty quickly. <laughs> Keep that in mind. That the whole world is going to be taxed in the United States. It has nothing to do with the Christmas. And all went to be taxed, everyone to their own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out into the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which was called Bethlehem. Because this is where he was of the house of the lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And it was so while they were there in the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the ends. And there were the shepherds in the countryside. What were they doing? They're watching over their sheep. And while they're watching over their sheep, what happened? What bursts onto the sea but angels singing? And they tell them about the, the birth of Jesus. They didn't say, wait a minute, let us get the sheep together. Let's put them all together and make sure we got a pin around them so that they're nice and safe. And, and then we'll go and see this Jesus. No. After the angels left, they gathered their thing. They said, let's go see this thing that has happened. This thing that these angels have told us about. You know what, church? Jesus is still here. He, had, he tells us to, faith, to forsake not the fellowship of gathering together. We're coming into this building for what purpose? That we would see Jesus. But yet, Jesus calls and we don't respond. He speaks to us through his word, but we don't respond. He tells us where to go and what to do, but yet we don't respond. The shepherds responded. You know what? I think sometimes if an angel appeared to us, we wouldn't respond. We'd hide. 
We'd be like old Scrooge and get under the bed shaking. Thought we saw a ghost. But no. Church, why are we forsaking Christ? Why are we forsaking getting into the Word? Why are we forsaking our devotional time? Why are we turning Jesus off instead of turning Him on? I know that we live in a hectic time. I know that we live in a world of chaos and confusion. But yet, we don't call upon Him like we used to. We don't have Holy Ghost foot stomping, pew hopping, hair wrecking services anymore. If we could say such a thing. <laughs> we have to be careful about how much time we use in church. Lunch will get burned if you have it in the crock pot or in the oven. We might miss the afternoon out watching golf game or going to a baseball game or going to somebody's house just to have time of fellowship because that pastor, he spoke too long. Mm. That guy is the most windiest. You know, he must not talk all week. He just can't wait to get the service and he go two hours. Mm. I remember the time when we'd go to church and the preacher preached for two hours. And when the service is over, we're like, why did he, why did he stop so soon? <laughs> this was getting good. And we don't have those days anymore. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. God commissions Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a, upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims, each one six wings, when Isaiah was commissioned, what was he commissioned for? Let me ask you a better question. What are you commissioned for? What are you commissioned to do? Amen. You see, when we begin to think about the Christmas story, and we begin to think about what Isaiah, you know, Isaiah is kind of known as the Christmas prophet. You know that. Because in Isaiah 7, 14, he says, A virgin shall conceive. He's, he's, she, she's not pregnant yet, but yet he's, he's prophesying. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, and behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. He's prophesying. He prophesied in Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For his name shall be called Wonderful. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, <laughs> Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen. The increase of his government and peace shall be no end. <clears throat> I think it's awesome how Isaiah begins to lay out the things that are going to happen. If I could trouble somebody to get me a little glass of water, maybe it's from Virginia's covers. <clears throat> the frog she had, she just gave to me, and I need to get it out. <laughs> Church, why is it when we think about Christmas, why is it when we think about the needs of the world? I begin to thank you, Randy. Why is it we begin to think about the times back then aren't like today? Why do we begin to think that, well, things aren't as bad as they were then as they are now? 
Because in chapter 1 of Isaiah, we, he talks to us about a wayward nation. The nation in which he lived in was a wayward nation. And in chapter 5, he starts talking about the woes that are pronounced upon Israel. And then what happens? He begins to talk about the needs of men. There's a new awareness of the character of God in verses 1 through 4 that we just read. When I go back and I think about what Isaiah has prophesied here in the beginning of chapter 6, and I can take my word and I can flip over to Luke chapter 2, because I believe that Luke is the only gospel writer who related the events recording in world history. His account was addressed to what predominantly the Greek. But see, Luke takes the word and he kind of ties it into today. You know, all of us love, I don't know about you, but I love the Christmas story. Yes, amen. I just, it's like a gift from God. A Christmas gift to you, if you will. And he, and he, and he unwraps it in the Gospels so neatly. And as you begin to read, you, you begin to see this beautiful gift unwrapped right before your eyes. And then salvation comes into the, the heart of man. And the, the most precious gift that God can give to you. Salvation. And what do we get at the beginning of salvation? Some people say, well, you said it, Pastor. When we receive the Lord, we have hard times. No. At the beginning of salvation, eternity begins. Amen? Amen? Eternity begins once we receive the Lord. What a gift! Yes, amen. If you have Jesus Christ in your heart and in your life today, just think, you are now in the light of eternity. You are experiencing Christ here on earth in your own hearts. And you're going to experience Christ as you see him once you leave this earth. How exciting can that be? Oh, yes. My mom loved Christmas. She loved Christmas so much that she kept her Christmas tree up all year long. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. She lit it every single night. Ask my wife. It wasn't a big tree like what we got over here. It was a little Christmas tree. And I, I often asked her a few times, especially when in her time when she was really sick and she wasn't doing well, and she'd say, plug my tree in. It's the middle of the day, Mom. That's okay, plug my tree in. I said, why? You know what she said? It reminds me, that tree reminds me that Jesus died on a tree. It wasn't a Christmas tree to her. It reminded her of the cross. Because she knew that little baby that came as a beautiful Christmas gift to her was going to die on a tree for her. When you think of the manger scene, what was the manger made out of? A tree. Yeah, yeah. It's made of wood. It's made from a tree. So he came, laying in a tree, died hanging on a tree. To live for eternity. Whoo! Hallelujah! Merry Christmas! <laughs> that would make you excited. I don't know what I mean. What's happened here this morning? I'm all excited. You guys are just like, okay, we got it, Pastor. No, man, where's the excitement? <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna have to bring the glasses up here. Oh, one second. <laughs> Maybe this will get, spark a little joy. There we go. Okay. Now I got your attention. <laughs> Yeah? All right. 
Now we can preach. Hallelujah. I got everybody to everybody looking right up here. I don't know if they're looking at me or they're looking at the glasses. It doesn't matter because I have your attention. You see, Jesus doesn't need stuff to get your attention. He has the word of God that gets our attention. The Christmas story church should have our attention. It should have our undying, unfounded love for the word of God because the word came to life. You hear me? The word came to life. And Amen. this life is living in us now. Because when he went back to heaven, greater things you will do than he has done. What has he done? He has put the joy of the Lord in your heart. He's put joy unspeakable in full of He's given you everything you need to have a joyful life, even in the midst of the storms that will come your way. Even at Christmas time, when the storms come, he's brought peace. He shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. I know this is nothing what I wanted to preach this morning. But the Holy Ghost wants to go a different direction. And that's okay with me. Because church, I think we're missing, we're missing it. We're missing a, the understanding of Christmas. We're missing the, the point of where we're supposed to be. Where are we supposed to be? What has God called you to do? What direction has he set your foot? Are you following it? What gifts has he poured into your life that you're not using? You're not illustrating for him. All of us have gifts and talents. Yeah, but Pastor, you know, I don't like speaking in front of people. My wife said this. She said, I don't like speaking in front of people. I said, but you sing in front of them. I don't want to do that either. <laughs> <laughs> but she does. Do you know why she does? Because it's a call. Because she has a call. Yep. Right. You see, anybody can sing. No. Anybody can preach. <laughs> Look what he did with me. Ha! You guys should have a great laugh. <laughs> it's the call. Yep. You see, church, it's the call that transforms the heart to do great things for God. Yes. I've heard many pastors say that when they accepted their jobs, they accepted their positions at their churches, it makes my heart grieve. Because I don't believe that the preaching is a position. I don't believe that yep. preaching is a job. I believe that it's a call. Yep. Yes. Because if it's a job, anybody can do it. You can hire anybody to do it. Yep. That's what call. But a call is something that comes directly from the Holy Spirit. Yep. Amen. It comes directly from God. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just want to say this to you this morning. Each one of you are called. That's right. Each one of you are called because you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're called. Do I know what your calling is? No. Do you know what your calling is? Yes. You just haven't answered it. <laughs> I got you. Some of you are like, well, I don't know what it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you do. Be still and know that I am God. He will speak to your heart. Yes. Amen. He will speak to the coffers of your heart. You will know what you are called to do. You might be just called to be a prayer warrior. You might be called to be an encourager. Mm -hmm. I love Irene's cards. Sometimes she sends me one. And they have the most encouraging words on it. And sometimes... And it's when I least expected to, I think. It has the most encouraging words. And I know God gives her those words that she writes. Because they speak to me. There are others who will call me and just give me a word. Or just say, I'm praying for you. And it's an encouragement to me. To know that there are others praying. And seeking the heart of God. You see, Christmas isn't just about the gifts 
that we received from one another, but it's the gift that came from the one above. Right. The greatest gift the world could ever have asked for is right there. Yes, Isaiah begins to tell us about it. Mark, Luke, and John, they begin to tell us about it as it begins to happen. That poor young girl in her early teens, they say, gets a visit from an angel and says, you're going to be with child. I don't know about you, but I think that little girl had to be scared. <laughs> I know not a man. <clears throat> the Holy Ghost will overshadow you, and you shall consent. <clears throat> Why is that? Because the prophecy was that she would he would be conceived of a virgin. Right. A pure vessel. You see, church, and all the wonderment of Christmas and all the beauty of Christmas, we know that he came in purity and he left in purity. Why? Because he didn't sin. He didn't sin. Jesus, the only sinless person to ever be on the earth, and lived in the corrupt time that he that he was born into, left uncorrupted. How many of us this morning could say, Lord, I wish I was uncorrupted? <laughs> I can. I wish I could say, Lord, I wish I was uncorrupted. Yeah. I wish the world would have never influenced me. I wish from the time that I was a tiny little top and I opened my little eyeballs. I wish I would have never seen it. Right. We were talking about testimonies the other night, and we were saying that some have come to the Lord and 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 their later years, you know, in their teenage years, and they had already experienced alcohol and drugs and things of the world and promiscuousness and all that stuff. And 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 their testimony is that the Lord came in and cleaned them up and, and, and moved them forward. What a great testimony how God turned their life around. Yes. And that's awesome. Yes. But this particular person said she came to the Lord when she was four. She didn't really have a testimony. I'm telling you what, church, that's the greatest testimony you can have. Oh, yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. well, Having say? Jesus in your heart from such a beautiful, prime young age. I don't remember how old Chelsea was, maybe six, four. Oh, she was four too. When she came to the Lord. Has she been a perfect child? I hope you're not watching. No! <laughs> Has she tried her parents? Yes! How many of you can say you tried your parents? Come on. Yes. Oh, yes. Throw that hand up there, yes. woman. Yes. There you go. <laughs> Why is that? Because we're not perfect. God knew we weren't going to be perfect from the foundation of the world. This is why he sent his son, Jesus. We celebrate him at Christmas. Mm -hmm. We sing happy birthday, Jesus. Yep. Don't know that December 25th is his actual birthday, but you know what? It doesn't matter. The fact that we remember that he came, that we celebrate the coming of the Lord. Amen. That's exciting. Gotcha. Yep. We're saying thank you, Jesus, for coming and saving me. Hallelujah. Yes. That's what we're celebrating. That's what Christmas is all about. My question to you this morning is, what do you need at Christmas? You need a Savior. God knew you needed a Savior and he sent Jesus. That the whole world might be saved. Church, 
What does that say to me? That precious gift is telling me this, that the whole world might be saved. He turned each one of us into an evangelist to share with the world the most precious love that he can give to us, his son Jesus. And we can give that to the world. Church, I don't know about you, but I know this. I can't wait to share that gift. I can't wait to share that gift with the world. I can't wait to tell the world about Jesus. Amen. Even if they don't want to hear. It's okay. It's my gift. And I want to share it. I'm not no spiritual hog or pig or whatever you want to call it. I want to share my gifts with the world. How about you? Do you want to share your gifts with the world? Do you want to share the most precious gift that God has given to us with the world? Or is it your desire to keep them to your side? I don't think there's one person in this room that would say, I want to keep them to myself. I want the world to know about his love and his desire to live in them. I think of, this is a very elegant major scene down here. Nothing, I think, really depicts what it was like when Jesus was born. (laughs) Yeah. That's very nice. But he came in a ratty, stinky old cave called a manger. Animal urine laying around. Stinky, stinky laying around. He came wrapped in swaddling clothes. And he was laid in a manger. Shepherds came to see him. Called by the angels. Church, what a gift. What a gift. What do you want to do with the gift? You want to keep it wrapped up? Nope. You want to keep it wrapped up and keep it close? No, I don't want to keep it wrapped up. I want to share it with the world. I want the world to know that he is still the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want the world to know that that most precious, most holy gift grew up to be a man that the world might be saved. Father, I thank you this morning for your love. Lord, I thank you for the Christmas gift. Lord, I know that the world needs this Christmas gift. And I pray, Lord God, that you will send us into the world to give this Christmas gift to the world. Lord, that they might be saved. That they might come to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus that their hearts would be transformed and the world would come to know who you really are through the servants that you have raised up to be evangelists. Lord, I can't begin to (coughs) understand why you would have allowed your son to be spit on cursed at and beaten beyond measure only to know that you did it for me you did it for the world you did it for everyone within this body this morning and each one that would be watching Lord I can only say humbly at this moment thank you Thank you for that most precious, holy gift that you gave to the world. That we would have eternal life. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for this that we speak this morning. Because it's in your name that we speak. In Jesus' name.
Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.